G'day everyone and welcome to the Growing SA Conference. Before we begin, uh, Livestock SA and Grain Producers SA acknowledge the Paramount people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and we respect their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to the land, water and community. And already I've lost my place. I'm Ricky Lambert, I'm from Flow FM. Uh, you might have heard me on the radio. Uh, it's great to be here with you. And it's easy to get excited when you've got those sorts of numbers and uh, imagery um, up on the screen. And in fact, we, um, you know, we've been really enjoying the last couple of years broadcasting on Flow FM uh, when there's so much optimism around the land because we know not only are hard times thankfully behind us, but they could be ahead of us as well. And that's a lot of why we're here today uh, to share what's happening in the industry. This is the fourth Growing SA conference hosted by Grain Producers SA and Livestock SA and it's the first in three years we're back thanks to uh, getting past the COVID challenges we had. So it's exciting to be able to gather in this fashion again today and great to have you all back at this event. Uh, I'm a broadcaster on Flow FM, uh, the news editor, uh, and uh, we broadcast all across regional SA as well as parts of Victoria and southern New South Wales. Uh, the name, uh, sorry, the boards of both the organisations, Growing SA, uh, that is Grain Producers SA and Livestock SA, had the vision for this forum where primary producers could hear the latest in policy developments, farm business advice and commodity research whilst networking with each other industry service providers and policy makers and we had some good networking last night at our dinner. Those that were able to be here was a great night and do take the opportunity not only to network during the breaks uh, but also check out the, um, the uh, displays downstairs uh, but be good uh, attendees and come back when the bells ring <laughs> when we need you back in your seats. Um, this uh, the name Growing SA was selected to highlight the important role primary production plays in the success of South Australia. Our industry makes an outstanding contribution to the state's economy as well as the fabric of rural or regional South Australia. This event is only made possible thanks to the support of our event sponsors and the exhibitors you can visit downstairs. Events like these are really hard to pull together without industry support, so we want to acknowledge and um, the support here today, starting with our event partner, the South Australian Government's Department of Primary Industries and Regions. Thank you for your vital partnership to help support South Australia's grain and livestock industries. A new platinum sponsor, the Regional Investment Corporation. We'll hear from Paul Dowler from them shortly. Thank you for your shared vision to support Growing SA as a platform to share and acknowledge, uh, share and information and knowledge with producers. We also acknowledge support from our gold sponsor, the Grains Research and Development Corporation, the GRDC. Silver sponsors are Bayer Crop Science, the Department of Environment and Water here in South Australia, Miller Olson Lawyers and Telstra. And there are many other supporters and exhibitors, including Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia, Rural Business Support, Commander Agquip, Purvis Agrofinance, uh, SA Power Networks, Spanlift, William Buck, Pod Talk, and I forgot someone, uh, us, Flow FM. Uh, and our sponsor's support for last night's Crop Life Australia Growing SA Dinner, Crop Life Australia, Thomas Foods International, and Ramsey Brothers. Now, some housekeeping. If this is your first visit to the venue, uh, the bathrooms, restrooms are down there to the left of the bar. Uh, over your right shoulder. There are also restrooms down below on the lower level. If, um, if we certainly hope we don't have to, but if we have to evacuate quickly, there are doors on this side of the venue. We'll proceed out those doors and out to the lawn up there. There's an evacuation plan behind, just near the AWI banner there. Um, today's event is about reaching beyond these four walls to share how much primary production supports South Australia. And social media is a great way to tell others outside of our industry just how awesome primary, primary production is. So if you're tweeting or posting on your chosen platform, please use the uh, hashtag GrowingSA and hashtag SAAG hashtags. I think they show up on the slides from time to time. Uh, don't come rushing up to the stage and do a selfie while someone's talking, please. But otherwise, please do your social media posting about the event. You whilst using your mobile phone, please make sure it's on silent. Today we have a broad cross-section of industry and producers in attendance, and we have a number of special guests, including parliamentarians. So just wanting to acknowledge some of those in attendance today, the Minister for Primary Industries and Regional Development, the Honourable Claire Scriven, who we'll hear from shortly. Thank you, Minister. 
Uh, we also acknowledge the Honourable Nicola Sandefani, Shadow Minister for Primary Industries and Regional SA, who I think is joining us a little later. Nick McBride, the member for MacKillop. Uh, we also have an apology from the Honourable Tony Passon, MP, Federal Member for Barker, who couldn't be here today due to a prior commitment. And we have apologies from State MPs, Fraser Ellis, the Member for Narunga, Adrian Pederick, the Member for Hammond, and Eddie Hughes, the Member for Giles. Thank you for your attendance today. Uh, just wanted to highlight for you as well, uh, You've got a program in your show bags if you haven't grabbed one of those already. Uh, we want to encourage your interaction during the sessions, particularly our Q&A time. And a bit like the Japanese, we'll start from the back of the book. You go back a bit here and you've got a QR code. Most of you know how to use those these days. Uh, you use that to ask questions of the presenters. We'll be taking questions from the moment the speaker joins the stage uh, via what, an app called Slido that will open on your phone when you when you um, scan that with your phone camera and you can post questions that will find their way through the internet to myself and we'll pose those to the speaker at the end of their presentation. So scan the QR code on the screens uh, and then navigate to slido.com, enter the event code, which uh, I think we've got that all written down for you there, but we'll explain that as we go along. Uh, the details are in the conference handbook. Uh, You've also, within that app, you can vote up someone's question. If you really like their question, then it's more likely we'll ask the question that has been voted up by others. So, without further ado, uh, representatives from our event partner and Platinum sponsor are going to open the conference. So I'd like to welcome the acting CEO of the Regional Investment Corporation, Paul Dowler, our Platinum sponsor, to the stage to get our third growing SA conference underway. Please welcome Paul. Oh, Paul. And I did forget to mention for our presenters, the steps are on this side of the stage. That's the former lawyer in me. I'm just concerned about that. Um, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm here to welcome everybody to this conference. I will talk a little bit about the RIC, but I do not want to labour too much on that. It really is about uh, your day and your conference. Um, myself, I'm the Acting Chief Executive Officer for the Regional Investment Corporation. We call ourselves the RIC. Um, and it's a pleasure to, to be here at the moment. Um, I'm normally from Orange in New South Wales, and uh, it looks similar to what is here. So it's great to be able to see things looking as they do at the moment, but to also recognise that that's not the case everywhere. Um, to acknowledge also the dinner last night, terrific to be able to be part of that, uh, to hear the speakers that uh, spoke and to be able to pick up that heartfelt and uplifting speech that, uh, that came through last night as well. Um, if we think about uh, South Australia itself, and I'm certainly no expert on that, but certainly from what I know, uh, you know if we look at South Australia, um, Last financial year, 15.4 billion in terms of agricultural output. Um, we've heard about the 100 billion target. Uh, that was, when that was sort of developed, it was around about 60 billion. And we're currently at 80, and obviously targeting that 100 billion. South Australia contributes around about 11% uh, of that. But something perhaps to consider, and you people know this, uh, in terms of if you look at agricultural output per millimetre of rain, South Australia is some of the most productive of farmers around, making the best use of scarce resources. And whilst this is about uh, livestock and grains, for South Australia, let's not forget the wine industry, which we all so much rely upon, where over 50% of Australia's wine grapes actually come from South Australia. So it's a significant part of what we, what we have, and you should be all proud that you do punch above your weight. If we look at the RIC, the Regional Investment Corporation, it's an Australian government concessional lender, principally for farm businesses. Uh, we've issued $3 billion in loans. And I know, and speaking with people this morning, people with people, speaking with people last night, that experience hasn't been great for everybody, um, but we are now up to date with what we've uh, issued in terms of loans, and we're now stepping forward in terms of what we can do and how we can serve better. Um, who do we lend to? For us, we lend to those that are in need and those that are also, at the same time, in a position that they can pay the money back. 
That's our role as, an, as, a, as a government lender. To give you an idea, if you were to think about, say, a range of one to five, one being really good, five being pretty bad, the group that we lend to is principally three and four. Those that perhaps don't get quite the same benefit from their bank, but those that do and have the capacity to be able to repay their loan. If you look at the map here, you'll see the, the heat map of, of where our loans are concentrated in that map of Australia. And when the RIC was set up, it was set up originally for a smaller number of loans. We then encountered that El Nino drought, which all of us know just how savage that was. And for, as a result of that, additional money was put to us to be able to therefore issue loans. If we look at that red belt, which covers then into South Australia, a couple of things there. One is you can see the shape of an El Nino drought very clearly as a result of that. And two, 65% of Australia's agricultural output comes from that area. So to get that impact that took place at that time gives you a significant uh, idea of just uh, how savage that, that drought has been and was, and people are still recovering even now from that. So these are things which aren't just one season, the impact of those droughts pervade and, uh, for, for years to follow. If we look at um, the RIC in terms of South Australia, so South Australia is 11% of that uh, $100 billion target. Um, for our RIC loan book, uh, our loan book, 9% of our loans are in South Australia. You'll see there, 77% are for livestock, 17% are for grain and cropping. And for those that are familiar with a RIC loan, for many, particularly a drought loan, uh, they came with a two-year interest-free uh, commencement. And 90% of borrowers from South Australia are currently in that interest-free period, providing significant benefit. If we look at the last financial year alone across our entire loan book, that saving in interest to farmers was 105 million. That saving interest to South Australian farmers is 10 million. So it is a significant saving and benefit that's been offered as a result of that. And we trust that that has made a big difference to the lives of, of your communities and farm businesses. Our products, there's five there. Um, and please, the easiest way to look at that is to simply look at our website, rick.gov.au. Um, but pretty much all those loans offer something similar other than plantation, but they're all five plus five, five years interest free, five years principal and interest. They're all in conjunction with the commercial debt. And the current interest rate for our loans is 3.04, so 3.04%, and that is adjusted twice annually. So that will be now fixed through until at least February of next year. So something just worth, if there is an interest, please, I'm happy to see inquiries come our way for that. It's not just about droughts which we've had, it's equally about droughts which we will go into. So it's about preparedness as well. If we look at this conference and uh, just um, the program which is in place, uh, the word sustainability is in, I think, six of the 10 presentations. It's a key term and it's something which we hear constantly, all the time, in terms of everyday things, farm business, life, and so forth. Uh, for farming communities, I guess there has been a time when we've used that word with a degree of contempt, thinking, push that away. But I think now there's a change that is now a word that is understood, even embraced, and needs to ultimately be owned. We need to own that as farm businesses to take control of what that means. But I'll give you a just my thoughts. My thoughts, what does sustainability mean? And it's going to come through in a number of speakers today. I think for me it's two things. One is it's about balance. Uh, it's about balance or equilibrium. And if we think in accounting terms, a debit and credit, if we think in um, physics terms, it's an equal force type thing. But for me it's about balance. 
And if we look at, for example, the relationship between a banker and a borrower, it's got to be fair between both parties. If you look at the relationship between environment and, say, farm, it's got to be fair. Both parties have to get some mutuality out of it. If you look at the relationship between, say, farmers and supermarkets, again, it's about getting an element of fairness between that. That means that both parties are benefiting from that arrangement. And if you look at any contract that you might have, supplier, whatever, again, two parties to that agreement, and it's got to be mutual. So for me, the word connotes equity and fairness uh, that goes with something being in place to be sustainable. It's about making sure both parties, or if there's more than two, all parties are getting something from it. Otherwise, it's not sustainable for one of them. The other thing that I think sustainability means for me is it's about long term. And I think certainly for farming, anyone who's associated with farming, it's the long game that you play. And I think sustainability, therefore, is about the long game, not the short terms, not the let's take something now, it won't matter for later. It is about playing the long game, the cycles, the cycles of one season to the next, the cycles from one drought to the next the cycles from one contract to the next, etc. So the word sustainability will come through a number of times. That's my, at least my sense of how we need to look upon it um, as something which we therefore look to create mutuality out of it. But I think uh, it's great to see that that is a term that's picked up so much more, but um, make of that your own uh, for how you then pick that up out of the speakers today, and I don't mean to take anything away from any of the speakers for what they might have been wanting to say, but that's just my sense of how I make meaning out of that word. Um, please enjoy today. My role is really to introduce you and to be able to welcome you to this conference. I'm very much pleased to be here, uh, pleased to be here as a visitor, but very much looking forward to today and hope everybody gets everything out of it that they are seeking. Enjoy the company, enjoy the collaboration, and enjoy the wisdom of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Dow, Acting CEO of uh, the Regional Investment Corporation, our platinum sponsor for today. And as Paul was saying, sustainability is indeed one of our key themes for today's event. The other themes being innovation, business management and building skills for a prosperous future. We will be exploring a range of topics and issues that have an impact on productivity and profitability of grain and livestock producers. Grain Producers SA and Livestock SA have coordinated a top lineup of speakers to present on the latest developments, policy and research, as well as panels that will further delve into the on-farm challenges and opportunities. And speaking of the panels, just in case I wasn't clear earlier, uh, in your program, this page has the QR code you can scan uh, and then use hashtag GrowingSA to put your questions to our presenters. And what better way to start the program than the Minister for Primary Industries and Regional Development, the Honourable Claire Scriven. Welcome, Claire. Uh, she is uh, raised in Mount Gambia and returned to the region after living and working in Adelaide for many years. She's previously been the State Manager of the Australian Forest Products Association and held private sector roles in forestry and human resources, as well as many years experience in government policy and service delivery. She is committed to regional development, social and economic inclusion, improving educational opportunities and supporting small business. She also has completed postgraduate studies in management and business. Claire is speaking with us today on sustainable policy for a profitable future. Please welcome the Honourable Claire Scriven. presenters. I'm not one of those. Oh, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to first of all acknowledge a number of people who are here in the room. Uh, the Honourable Nicola Centrofanti, Shadow Minister for Primary Industries, and the Honourable Nick McBride, Member for MacKillop. Uh, Joe Keynes, President of Livestock SA. Adrian McCabe, Chairman of Grain Producers SA. And Professor Simon Maddox, Chairman of Primary Producers SA. And I know that there are a lot of other uh, very significant industry people here in the room. 
Well, isn't it great to be back here at Growing SA Conference for the first time since 2019? Uh, I'm thrilled to be here standing as the Minister for Primary Industries, Regional Development and Forest Industries. I've been in the job uh, about five months now, and you've had a little bit of an introduction uh, from Ricky there, but I'll just perhaps uh, touch on a couple of other things. Uh, as he mentioned, I was raised in Mount Gambia and then returned to the regions probably about five or six years ago. So I now live at Port Macdonald, uh, not far from Mount Gambia. I was elected in 2018 to the Upper House of Parliament. So that means I'm uh, just over halfway through an eight year term. Uh, I did work uh, in the forestry sector and also for many years with disadvantaged job seekers. Uh, I guess regional development is a real passion for me. Uh, as well as supporting industry growth and small business and educational opportunities, I'm also really aware of the constraints that so much of the agricultural sector is facing at the moment and, in fact, regional communities in general in terms of workforce challenges and housing in particular. Uh, the theme of the, or one of the themes of this conference is indeed sustainability. And sustainability means many things. Uh, our regions and the sectors that you are all uh, representing are emerging from challenges of recent years. And my priority is to support stability and prosperity, not just for the next four years, but for generations to come. And I think the people in this room, you're all very used to looking long term. And I think it's incredibly important for the agricultural sector that governments are also looking long term. It's not helpful for the sector to have uh, constant change and constant reversals of policy. So I'm really pleased that where there were some good things from the previous government, I'm able to continue those. And the Malinowskis Labor government is looking at additional ways and of course fulfilling our election promises, but going forward, looking at the sorts of things that will sustain the agricultural communities and regional communities for a long time to come. Because we need those regional communities and the agricultural sector to be sustainable in terms of population and growth. Often when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about climate risks and so on, but there's far more to it when it comes to sustainability of regions and the agricultural sector. We want to have thriving regional communities uh, and that depends a lot on the services that are provided. So I'm very acutely aware of the importance of that to the sector. And it's probably just worthwhile very briefly reflecting on the challenges that the agricultural sector has faced uh, probably, I guess, since the last conference in 2019. At a global level, there's been huge interruptions to uh, international supply chains and the increased costs of farm inputs, such as chemicals, fuels and fertilisers. They've been huge. And more locally, our regions and primary producers have shouldered the impacts of severe weather events, droughts, floods and storms, uh, as well as biosecurity, emergency responses and bushfire. And of course, all of this while everyone's facing a global pandemic. So I don't think it's an understatement to say that it's been some challenging times. And yet, despite all of that, food, wine and agribusiness has remained the absolute core of our economy. It's our largest export sector, our largest manufacturing sector, uh, a key part of our tourism offering, and the major employer and economic driver of most South Australian regional communities. And indeed, in, in 2020-21, despite COVID and the other challenges, the sector increased revenue by 9% to $15.4 billion. And while I absolutely acknowledge that uh, some of our sectors continue to face very serious challenges, food, wine and agribusiness will continue to be that core of our economy. And so now more than ever, it is important that there's reliability and there's long-term stability for our regions and our primary industries. And it's only through listening and working collaboratively together that we'll be able to deliver on the best outcomes for our state. Uh, last season, grain growers in most parts of the state had a good income year with average to above average crop production combined with near record high prices for grains. I recognise the Mali cropping area didn't have the same production uh, to fully capitalise on that. And I'm advised that this season is progressing well despite a later start in some parts and below average rainfall during July. However, recent weeks have seen some useful rainfall and I'm told that crops in most, most districts are in good condition with high yield potential. And grain prices, while early signs uh, indicate 
by remaining well above average, have eased slightly on last season's near record prices. But managing risks is of course a key part of every business, and even more so for every profitable, sustainable business. Climate is just one of the risks that farmers manage. Uh, grain is right in good markets now, but like droughts, no doubt lower prices will also return at some stage. Sustainability is about managing climate risks, market risks and production risks. And we will continue to face significant climate risks, including drought. Uh, together with the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund, the State Government is supporting producers to further invest in their risk and financial management skills, as well as in personal wellbeing and natural resource management knowledge. Through the SA Drought Hub, farmers can access the latest tools and technology and participate in activities designed in collaboration with farmers to meet local needs. Communities will have the opportunity to come together and develop regional drought resilience plans which will identify what communities that are dependent on the agricultural sectors need to be better prepared and also more resilient to drought. And there are also opportunities in preparing for climate change impacts. There are emerging markets in carbon and biodiversity which will provide opportunities to recognise the ongoing stewardship of the land by farmers, to increase productivity of land, enhance the environment and provide continued or, in or increased access to markets where the requirement to demonstrate sustainability credentials is growing. And I'm sure most people in this room would be very aware of the changes in consumer sentiment. Uh, consumers are more looking at uh, traceability, and look, they're looking at the provenance of uh, the food they're consuming and the goods that they're purchasing. So I think it's fair to say that the demand for th those sorts of systems are going to only increase. Uh, information for South Australia needs to be contextualised for our state. Pro producers need to be able to see how it's going to affect them here in SA before they can make decisions about how to participate in things like carbon markets and so on. Uh, and that's why programs such as the Growing Carbon Farming Pilot are so very important. The pilot is a $1 million initiative to encourage carbon farming adoption and to build the carbon market in South Australia. Grants of up to $100,000 for at least six projects will help cover establishment costs, including te technical advice and carbon measurement. Now, the goals of the pilot are, um, I was going to say threefold, they're fourfold. So to increase industry knowledge and awareness of South Australia's carbon farming opportunities by demonstrating methods that have the greatest applicability to South Australia. We really want that to be about South Australia and how it can benefit people here. Uh, to deliver extension activities, including workshops, field days, and a case study for each pilot carbon project funded to address the current gaps that are in knowledge and capacity uh, in terms of uh, you know, what is actually limiting the uptake of carbon farming in South Australia. Uh, to demonstrate the direct financial value of carbon, fa carbon farming to individual enterprises and to increase industry knowledge of the social economic, environmental and First Nations co-benefits of carbon, far carbon farming activities in South Australia. Now, Grain Producers SA has taken initiative in this space uh, with a $20,000 state government grant for a project identified in the grain industry blueprint, which is exploring technology to measure and assist in reducing on-farm emissions. Uh, the new technology will be trialled in South Australia and it's actually a national first, which I think we really need to be quite uh, aware of and proud of. I was, had breakfast um, this morning with um, uh, Grain Producers SA and Livestock SA representatives and they were just talking about how far advanced we are in South Australia in terms of sustainability. And we need to be able to, obviously there's still a lot more work to do, but we also need to be able to tell that story because that's important not just internally within our state, uh, but also in terms of leading the country in a lot of the initiatives that we do have. Uh, the technology is called Flint Pro and it will allow farmers to evaluate, benchmark and communicate the environmental footprint of their production. So for the first time in Australia, Flint Pro for farms will be able to be used by grain producers to measure their greenhouse gas outputs from on-farm activities, as well as the embedded emissions, which is really important. So in the emissions in farm inputs, such as fertiliser, chemicals and diesel. Uh, expressions of interest for that program, uh, I'm told, will open at the end of this week, so uh, certainly keep your eye out for that.
Now, sustainable also means sustainable communities. Uh, PERS, my department, PERS's purpose is to advance the prosperity and sustainability of South Australia's primary industries and regional communities. Uh, the emergency management program is a big part of that, and that's to ensure that PERSA can most effectively prevent, prepare for, and respond to biosecurity incidents and other emergencies, support both the economic but also the social recovery of primary producers and regional communities from adverse events and build preparedness and resilience in regional communities because as people in these industries know, the next challenge is always not very far around the corner. A PERS's Recovery and Resilience Group works closely with community and industry stakeholders to ensure that we have the relationships and understanding required to quickly and effectively establish and deliver recovery support programs when required. Uh, industry, of course, has been absolutely <coughs> instrumental in working with us on impact assessments uh, and identifying recovery needs, which has been critical to securing assistance for farmers. The team is currently delivering several recovery programs, including drought, bushfire and storms, and administering 14 grant programs. These programs are designed to ensure that impacted farmers and industries return to something of a new normal. I think everyone's a little bit sick of that term, new normal, but uh, we're still trying to work out exactly what it means. But we want something like a new normal of productivity and of profitability and to build resilience for the future. Uh, so, for example, uh, there's been a, 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 a over $50 million of financial assistance to farmers administered uh, over the last few years, those farmers being affected by drought, bushfire or storms. And our family and business or FAB mentor team provide an ongoing wellbeing service to any farmer or regional community that is struggling with the challenging times. Uh, the service is free, is confidential and independent and supports people to problem solve and to be able to act for themselves. FAB mentors work closely with local service providers and other stakeholders to complement the existing services and to ensure people get the help that they need. And sustainability is also about defence. Biosecurity is an ongoing and significant challenge for our primary industries. And I must say, a few times in the short five months that I've been Minister, I felt like saying, introducing myself as Minister for Biosecurity, we've had so many different threats and, and emerging threats coming through. Uh, but we need to have product integrity to be preserved, to maintain and build our valuable international markets. And it's a constant challenge. Uh, with work continuing by our government in South Australia on the current fruit fly outbreaks, Japanese encephalitis and the varroa mite in bees. And the challenge has really been ampl amplified recently with the growing risks of diseases that are not currently present here in SA, in SA or indeed in Australia, but present in our near neighbours such as Indonesia, uh, looking at foot and mouth disease at the moment as well as lumpy skin disease. So the Commonwealth, in partnership with states and territories, continue to operate the very strong border controls and biosecurity programs that have kept these diseases out of the country so far. And yes, governments have programs in place to, ready to go in the event of an outbreak, including resources, systems and expertise that's already in place. But one thing I've really been trying to emphasise whenever I have the opportunity is that this is a collective challenge and it's a collective responsibility. It's the responsibility of governments, of industry, and of the general community at large. Uh, I think industry is working very, very well with government, and I certainly would like to pass on uh, our government's appreciation of that. And I've been trying to talk in you know, every opportunity to, to media or so on about the community responsibility as well, because I think many people in our community don't actually realise the impact it would have on them if we had foot and mouth disease, if we had lumpy skin disease here in Australia. So part of our role is to increase that awareness without panicking people, because that's actually not good for the industries in this room either, but really making people aware of how they can help in that collective responsibility of uh, keeping uh, emergency animal diseases and plant diseases out of Australia. So first and foremost in that is the need for early detection of exotic diseases should they occur here in Australia. And that's being done by diligent and careful observation of our livestock uh, with government biosecurity personnel as well as primary producers on this front line of surveillance. And the challenge is also to show uh, producers and the community how to, how to identify these diseases. We haven't had them here in Australia, so uh, some people are not going to be aware of what the signs are. 
So I'm pleased to announce that one of the proactive steps the government's taken to help in the observation and identification of exotic diseases in livestock uh, is the development of the Augmented Reality Emergency Animal Disease Sheep App. That's a mouthful. I'm not going to say that over again. I'm just going to call it the Sheep App. Uh, funded through the Red Meat and Wool Growth Program and developed by South Australian company Think Digital and in collaboration with Animal Health Australia, this app uh, can, uh, can help in educating our producers and the wider community about how to recognise the signs and symptoms for emergency animal diseases in sheep. And hopefully that will help in rapid detection and response should an incur incursion ever occur. I'm very excited about the application of this technology in disease surveillance. I'm looking forward to having a go at the augmented reality um, app, uh, the headset here myself today at about uh, in, in the morning tea break. So please, I would also encourage you to pay a visit to the PIRSA trade display for a closer look and to experience the technology firsthand. It's receiving world recognition for being an innovation that can be applied to the detection of foot and mouth disease. So again, it's another area where we are leading not only the country in this case, but also the world. So, so I've spoken about sustainability policy and programs related to climate and biosecurity. Uh, and they're front of mind as major risks to our sustainable farming systems. But I'd also like to briefly mention an example of production sustainability which perhaps has been uh, somewhat overlooked uh, by the, the big ticket areas, the things like FMD that get a lot of attention. But soil acidity has increased across South Australia, um, with around 3 million hectares now considered acid prone in South Australian agricultural areas. So without interventions to reduce the acidification of our soil, we'll see loss of production in pastures, resulting in reduced livestock carrying capacity. Uh, and crop pro productivity can also be impacted by the soil acidification. So PIRSA has run programs with various partners, such as the Grains Research and Development Corporation, the Department of Environment and Water, and other partners, which has increased awareness with farmers and with agribusiness. These programs have developed assessment techniques and are determining the best ways of treating acidity under modern no-till cropping systems. Uh, the GRDC just extended the, the, uh, the Liming Trial program and the extension effort delivered through SADI for another three years, which is uh, a good outcome. Our farmers and agribusiness response has included the rate of lining agricultural soils increasing from about 70,000 tonnes per year in 2007 to around 300,000 this year. So I congratulate all of the organisations and individuals who are contributing to defending our industries against these various threats. So sustainability through supporting communities, through managing risks in climate, in market demands, and production and disease. One key thing I think that all of these uh, depend on is sustainable collaborations. And I'm very pleased with the sorts of collaborations that I've been able to see uh, in my short five months so far as Minister. The role of uh, individuals and organisations such as uh, you here today is absolutely imperative. Uh, I, as Minister, I want to be always open to listening to what it is that industry needs. I can't promise we'll always be able to agree or always be able to deliver, but to be able to hear and listen and develop those conversations and those plans together in collaboration is absolutely the key to all those aspects of sustainability. So I am excited by the opportunities ahead. I look forward to working together to achieve great outcomes for the future prosperity of our great state. I also congratulate the conference organisers for a well thought out conference uh, on their very appropriate theme of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Would you mind staying and we could ask you a few questions to let you just get comfortable for a moment? I did work in politics for a while, so I just came up on this side of the stage. Do as I say, not as I do. You go up those steps and I'll come up this side. Uh, now, Claire, I've got a box of chocolates to give you afterwards, but uh, just, just like a box of chocolates, uh, you know the questions, you don't know what you're going to get, but you might have expected this Turkish delight from Nick McBride. How do you capture the need for workers in regional Australia and address the shortage of affordable housing acknowledging market failure? That's an excellent question. And because there's such a simple answer, we've got it all sorted and we'll have it set by next week. It's uh, absolutely an ongoing issue. And so I, I think workforce and related to that housing 
uh, shortages are probably the number one issue that have been raised with me, not only since I've become Minister, but in the 18 months prior when I was uh, Shadow Minister. So I think there's a number of things that we need to be doing in regards to workforce. Um, now obviously, nationally, there's the, uh, the, the Jobs and Workforce Summit this week, and it will be useful to see what comes out of that. I think also really making sure that we're sharing what organisations are doing. So there are organisations in this room who have been working on workforce issues. And what we don't want to see is lots of people uh, investing resources in different things but not talking to each other. So it comes back again to some of that collaboration. Uh, also some uh, looking at what the, uh, the balances are. So we need to look at our visa system and trying to speed up some of the visas in particular that are being applied for for overseas workers. But that's only one part of the puzzle. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, you know, currently we have uh, what's considered full employment at 4%. But we also have quite a low participation rate in South Australia. And so what can we do to be increasing that participation rate? Uh, linked to that, of course, for uh, a, a, a lot of the um, relatively low participation rate is because, in, particularly in regional areas, a lot of women are not in the paid workforce and uh, many of those may wish to be in the paid workforce if there was the opportunity. And childcare is a, uh, a constraint on that. I was talking last night to someone, you know, if we were to be able to click our fingers and find, uh, you know, and create a, a childcare centre in Udunda, for example, it wouldn't be a clear group of fingers, it would take several years at the minimum. So what other options are there? Can we be looking at ways to uh, promote, for example, family daycare, which has much shorter lead time? Uh, are there opportunities for employers to look differently at the way that they uh, are employing, uh, rather than simply talking about jobs share and, um, uh, and part-time work, actually have a, an ongoing half-shift possibility? Now, for some industries, that, that won't work. But it's important to be looking at those. We have a lot of people who are considered to have a uh, disability, which might simply be an inability to stand for long periods of time. Could they be working half shifts on an ongoing basis? I think there's a lot of opportunity to have more conversations around uh, flexible types of uh, approaches to the workforce issue. But none of them are going to be a silver bullet. There are going to be a combination of uh, of approaches. Uh, they need to be tailored for different industries and sectors within those industries. Linked to all of that is housing. And that's why I think it's really important that we do look at all the opportunities we have to utilise some of the underutilised workforce that exists currently in regional areas. So um, we can bring people in, we might be able to attract people from uh, other states uh, as well as overseas, but where are we going to house them? If in addition to doing some of that, we could actually be utilising more of the local workforce. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I, I worked for a long time with uh, job seekers who had significant disadvantages, uh, ex-offenders, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, long-term unemployed. Uh, and generally, the barriers were not just limited to their ability to get a job. It started from the aspirations of their families or lack thereof. Uh, there's a whole social piece of work around why we have uh, numbers in our community who are considered often to be unemployable. And I get that a lot of businesses say, look, I'm a farmer, I'm not a social enterprise. Uh, and you know, look, I get that. But I think as a community, we can also look at it from an economic point of view, if not a social point of view as well, which is that we have, uh, we have a potential workforce that already has housing, that's already living in our regional areas. If there are opportunities, and there's got to be government involvement in this, but not just government involvement, uh, to actually uh, work with those individuals to be able to get them to a situation where they're work ready, then that's actually going to be a benefit for our, our society, but also for our economy and for you who are looking for, uh, for workforce. In terms of housing, um, the Malinowskis Labor government went to the election uh, saying that we would build an extra 400 social houses and 150 of those will be in regional areas and that's already uh, in, in train. Now we realise that that's just one step. It's an important step but it is just one step. So the government's also doing a lot of work, uh, including working with regional development associations and others to try to address the, the housing crisis. Um, but the housing crisis is also has been a long time coming. We, I think there's been a lot more uh, attention on it, particularly in metropolitan areas um, due to COVID, 
But a lot of you who are from regional areas know that it's actually been there for a long time. It's just been magnified in the last couple of years. So we need some uh, long-term approaches. It would be great if there was a, an easy answer, uh, but I think talking about some innovative solutions tailored to individual areas is one of those answers. Thank you, Claire. Comprehensive answer. We've got quite a few questions here. And uh, using the Slido app, if you were here a bit late, just to clarify one last time, use the QR code in your brochure and enter hashtag growing SA to ask your questions and also to upvote uh, questions that you'd like asked. Uh, this one here uh, has been sitting on the list for a little bit. What are the current avenues to support new entrants to enter the agricultural industry? So I guess there's two aspects to that. It's not, you know, the, the question could mean two things. So one is um, you know, new investors to actually take on farm enterprises, and the other is encouraging people to pursue uh, the agricultural industry as a career. Um, in the terms of the first, I think we need to do more work on that. There's a lot of barriers to entering as, as an enterprise, and there's the opportunity to do some more work on that. And I'm you know, certainly keen to continue conversations about that. Uh, in terms of attracting people to the industry, which of course is a, is a linked topic, I think there's a number of things we can be doing and I've certainly been having a lot of conversations uh, around some of the work that's happening. I attended the um, Agricultural Students Growing the Future conference a, a few weeks ago, or well it was a, uh, a dinner. Absolutely incredible. Who, was, who else was there? Who was there at that? Hands up. Yeah, so a few. I really encourage you to talk with others about that. Um, fantastic opportunity for us to see those who are currently studying in the agricultural fields, as well as the employees who are looking for staff. Uh, really well, well run event and it showed, I think, which is really important, it showcased some of the diverse careers that are in agriculture. And I think that's probably the biggest barrier that we have in terms of attracting people to the sector is a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding about the diversity of careers. Um, I'm going to share a story which, is, which I wish you didn't have to share. A few weeks ago I was at another event, um, Simon Maddox was there and he was talking about how uh, when he was at school or due to leave school and go on to university, he was talking about doing agricultural science or a, rel a, a similar degree and he was told that he was too smart for that. Now that's an appalling approach. And I thought, well look, you know, that's some years ago, you know, hopefully things have changed. Another woman who was at the table said, my son experienced that a couple of years ago. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, all right. A couple of isolated incidents. Uh, and then last night I was talking to uh, a second year student who is uh, currently studying ag. And she was at a, a school where she was told, this is obviously only a couple of years ago, uh, to go and do ag will be a waste of an ATAR. Now, we should all be groaning, we should all be going, how is this happening? We know that the agricultural sector has been a leader in so much technology and development. Uh, other sectors such as space, such as medicine, have all leaned on the agricultural sector for some of those innovations and that research. Uh, we know that there is a lot happening in the space. I think we really need to uh, make sure that when we've got our ambassadors, people like uh, Geordie Kitschke, who some of you might know, who's been very active in robotics and is a start-up in that, we need people like that and others to be spreading the word to other potential students, but also to the teachers. They need to understand that there is huge opportunities in this sector. Uh, and, you know, when I was at the, at the dinner, uh, I think it, we were told there's uh, four jobs for every agricultural graduate. Is that right, James? Five, okay, five jobs for every agricultural um, graduate. And yet we have, nothing against lawyers, if there's, any, if there's any lawyers in the room, but you know, we have people doing law degrees when we know there are four graduates for every job, the opposite of what we want. Why haven't we got some of those smart kids who are being pushed into law or medicine being pushed into ag? And that's where I think we really need to do a better job in terms of selling the industry promoting the industry um, and I was talking again last night with some ideas uh, around you know, working with, uh, with teachers, not ag teachers, although that's important, but general teachers and careers advisors so that they realise you know, uh, agriculture isn't only sitting on a tractor, you know, there is so much involved in it and uh, we've got to make sure we maximise more opportunities to tell that story. 
Now, Minister, I don't want to pull a Mr. Speaker on you. We're running out of time, but I've got a couple of burning questions coming up the list here. Quite fittingly, given the way debate has proceeded in the last six months, this one's raced to the top of concerns. Does PIRSA have enough resources to scale up to respond to a biosecurity incursion? A very good question. Um, and the answer is, look, for many things, we, um, we access funds as we need it. So, for example, in the fight against fruit fly, uh, we don't... Uh, assign a certain budget for the next three years for fruit fly because we hope, hopefully we're going to eradicate it by the end of the year. Uh, but when it comes to biosecurity issues, as extra resources are needed, we access that fu those, those funds. Um, and so far in my five months I haven't had DTF say no, so that's a good thing. Uh, but also in terms of the staffing within PIRSA, um, uh, staffing are being reallocated towards biosecurity and we're certainly not having any cuts whatsoever in the biosecurity workforce uh, within PIRSA. So I think it's one good thing about there being so many, if there's any good thing about being so many biosecurity threats at the moment, is that it has really elevated the awareness in the general public and, might I say, within government as well. So that's a positive thing because <coughs> pardon me, it means that people are becoming more aware of the importance of appropriate resourcing. Uh, and so I'm certainly obvious, uh, obviously keen for that awareness to be increased uh, and making sure that we are suitably able to respond. Uh, and some of the wonderful things that we've had, you know, working with, for example, Livestock SA for the webinars about foot and mouth disease, lots of other industry government partnerships, that's a really important part as well because, as I mentioned in my speech, it's a shared responsibility and a shared challenge. Minister, I'll give you a chance to have a sip of your water if you like. I'll combine two questions here uh, that I think are pretty closely related to each other. Uh, the first premise of the question is uh, agriculture departments in New South Wales, WA, Victoria and Queensland have climate change and or adaptation strategies. The question claims SA does not. Why and what is happening to address this? And uh, there is a $1 million carbon pile that the government, I believe, has announced. WA has a $13 million carbon fund. Queensland. 500 million, the question claims, LRF, New South Wales, 90 million carbon program, Victoria, a 13 million fund. Is the government considering a more support than it's put on the table already? And that first question is, what is happening on climate change or adaptation strategies in ag departments? Okay. Right. That question was almost as long as one of my answers. Okay. Um, look, I think that there's a whole lot of work that's happening in that space. Uh, I think as a um, government, Labor, as a party, Labor has been um, at the forefront of uh, promoting the need for climate adaptation uh, and we work really well across, with, across our various departments uh, in terms of that. Um, we're constantly looking at the resources that we are utilising, how they're being utilised and what the plans need to be going forward. Uh, that collaboration with industry is an incredibly is an important part of that because we want to make sure that the directions that we're going are um, not only achieving the outcomes we want, but they are achievable in terms of industry adaptation. So it's uh, ongoing work uh, and I'm happy to keep you updated as we progress. Now, uh, there's a, another question about resources in Persia. You've talked about buttressing, I guess, the... Uh, Nicola, are these all your questions? No, I don't no? think she's here okay. yet. <laughs> uh, oh, Nicola's not here today. Oh, not, yeah. not here yet. She's coming later. The question uh, here, and you mentioned about, I guess, firewalling, if you like, biosecurity elements of Persia from cuts, but the question is, how does the Malinowskis Labor government plan to support SA agriculture with dwindling public service resources in Persia? Look, I, I would... Um I would say, I don't think we can really describe them as dwindling public resources in Persia. Um, all government departments, apart from what were designated frontline departments such as health and education, uh, had some modest savings that were um, required in the state budget. Uh, and Persia, of course, has to, uh, has to meet some of those savings as well. But I've said on a number of occasions that you know, biosecurity is an absolute priority uh, and also the staff in regional areas. So I've had discussions, obviously it's the chief executive's uh, prerogative in terms of staffing the department, uh, but I've had a number of conversations with him about the need to make sure that we don't lose staff in our regional areas. Uh, and that's, that sort of comes back to that theme of sustainable communities because whereas you know, in Adelaide if we you know, lose one job, it, well, it's one job. In regional communities, often if you lose one job, then the person moves away, their partner moves away, the kids come out of the schools. It can have a whole lot of ripple effects. So I'm very conscious of the need to maintain the workforce in regional areas. Um, and also, what we have done is um, 
try to cut at the top where that's possible rather than um, at the sort of front line type of roles. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, my chief executive uh, is confident that he's able to uh, operate quite effectively with a slightly change, a change structure. And what that means is by saving money from a couple of uh, very senior positions in metropolitan Adelaide, we're able to retain uh, a lot more positions in regional South Australia. Uh, and I think that's a good balance and entirely achievable. I'll ask one last question. Uh, with the biosecurity surveillance underway, there is a critical shortage, the question claims, of vets, veterinarians in the regions. Are you encouraging vets to work in rural industries? Yes. Oh, good. We can ask <laughs> anything more. I can add a little bit more. Um. Yes, so, the, I mean, we've got a vet shortage in South Australia overall. Um, I'm currently in the process of uh, having drafted some amendments to the, uh, to the Veterinary Services Act, which hopefully will make things like registration easier in South Australia, particularly for those who are returning following an absence, um, whether that's you know, maternity leave or, or other reasons for absence. Uh, and I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, we also need to be encouraging more people to study vet science comes back to my earlier comments in regards to, uh, you know, we've got teachers pushing high ATAR students towards law and medicine. Why aren't they pushing them towards, for example, vet science if they've got that um, uh, a bit that way? Uh, so I think, again, that's something that has developed over a long time, the shortage of vets and the shortage of vets in regional areas. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of some of the the tensions between you know, small animal vets and um, outward services for small animals and companion animals compared to, uh, to livestock and farm animals. So uh, it's an ongoing issue. Certainly I'm aware of it and uh, you know, keen to hear additional ideas on what we can do to improve that. But one part of that is the changes to the legislation that I'll be um, hopefully introducing to Parliament later this year. Well, Minister, the Shadow Minister may not be here, but she seems to be here in spirit with a question about vets to finish off. Uh, here's a box of chocolates as a gratuity for you joining us today. Minister, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I'd like to uh, encourage uh, and invite our next presenter. We welcome to the stage Professor Andy, Cor Andy Coronius, CEO and Managing Director of SmartSat CRC. The CRC is a consortium of industry and research organisations developing game changing satellite technologies to catapult Australia into the global space economy. That makes me excited. Professor Coronius holds academic qualifications in electrical engineering, computing, and education, and a PhD from the University of Queensland. A great deal of his qualifications are actually listed in that guide I showed you earlier that's in your bags, so uh, you may want to consult further with his vast experience in that bio that's written there, but he's speaking to us today on how intelligence from space, I don't think we're talking about another species, uh, intelligence from space could transform Australian agriculture. Please welcome Professor Andy Coronius. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. And before I start, um, I think the minister gave a superb answer to this silly, silly comment about um, wasted ATARs and not smart enough to be in the agricultural sector. Uh, agri the agricultural sector is a high science and high tech industry, and if it's not there yet, it needs to become in order to compete and in order to feed the world as we are growing. And, and we at SmartSat are here to play a small role, but hopefully an Australian and significant role in that area. Colleagues, despite Australia being the third country to launch a satellite, we are not able, we do not have a camera to take a selfie. In a volatile world, an unpredictable world, is this what we want Australia to be? To always be using other people's assets. Now, there was a good reason why we didn't launch our own satellites. The reason for that is because we didn't focus in that area 
and in some ways we weren't even capable of doing it because satellites in the past became very large, very ex complex, and very expensive. Satellites were the size of a bus. They would be probably take five years or so to design and build and launch, and then it would cost roughly between half a billion and one billion dollars. So it was a very large undertaking that only governments and only a few governments and mega companies can undertake. But things have changed as with miniaturization of electronics, things have changed very dramatically in the last 10 years. As you know, min the miniaturization of electronics has made it possible for you to hold or in, in the palm of your hand or on your wrist or even on my smart ring to hold power that is nearly just as much as the Apollo mission. In fact, in some ways, much more than that. And that had then has opened opportunities for us to build satellites that are the size of a thousand times smaller than the traditional satellites. And certainly, instead of costing 800 million, they cost a couple of million, two or three million to actually build and launch. And they are the size of a Kellogg's cereal box. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said Kellogg's. <laughs> the size of a cereal box. That's the type of miniaturization and ability that we now have. And by the way, with the right cameras and the right sensors, they can be 10 times the, the quality of the image that you would collect from those satellites as you would on the old traditional satellites that countries have used. So back in 2020, we thought we wanted to change this. So we brought together a cooperative research center. We brought together industry, universities, the government labs, and end users to, to actually form a community of researchers for us to get Australia to become a space-capable nation, at least to deal with the R&D element of that. We are very well coordinated by our space agency, we work hand in hand with our space agency and many other agencies, such as GA, BOM, uh, and of course the CSIRO. We brought together more than 130 organizations and went to the government and said, would you fund us? And we were very, very lucky to receive funding from the federal government. We received, altogether, we raised more than $250 million to be spent in seven years or so, uh, and indeed that's been growing by about 20 million a year. So this, this is a significant effort. In fact, it is the biggest uh, effort for space industry collaboration in Australia's history. And what we want to do is to do R&D that would help the sectors of Australia that are the most important to Australia. And of course, agriculture and sustainability, climate, and so on, are a very, very, very important. They are the top uh, industry for us in Australia to be supporting. Mining and resources is another area. And of course, as you can see, in a very unpredictable and almost hostile geopolitical environment, we also need to spend to become smarter and more technologically capable to create asymmetries, if you like, in the area of uh, defense and national security. So these are the areas what, that we will apply our research in communications, in IoT connectivity, the next generation of technologies of these, and of course in earth observation and remote sensing, which is critical to agriculture and to many other sectors that we have. So what we've decided to do is not just only just have projects and technologies, but to bring them all together like Lego pieces to actually solve some major challenges. And as I've said, one of those is water security. I think it was mentioned today. Water security is very, very important to Australia. And we have something called the AquaWatch, a set of missions using satellites 
to go further in not only understanding our 400,000 water repositories around Australia, but also understand its quality. And to do that over time, hopefully almost in real time, uh, so that we can in fact have clean water and not only for drinking, but also agricultural purposes and others. We're working together with the CSIRO in partnership with the CSIRO to achieve that. The middle one I will not talk very much about. It's the Indo-Pacific connector. It's all about military communications and earth observation for our defense and national security. We are working very closely with DST as well as defense and the, the new space command yeah, in that uh, effort. We have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> another mission, the Eye in the Sky, which is about disaster uh, resilience, if you like, detection of fires, but also even prevention, detection, response, and even recovery at the end. And looking to see what the impact on agriculture some of the uh, disasters may be, like, for instance, bushfires or floods. If it's not, if Australia is not burning in one, uh, in one part of Australia, it's probably a flood in another, uh, unfortunately. And of course, now we are launching a new one. We are, we are talking to our colleagues, the end users, as well as the research organizations that are relevant to agriculture, uh, one which is called TerraWatch. TerraWatch is, our, is agricultural intelligence from space, as I've mentioned previously, it's all about using Earth observation and IoT technology to improve decision making on the farm, uh, collectively also to improve of, on agriculture as well as the climate. The AquaWatch as a national architecture is what we have, a constellation of small satellites that are not as high as the bigger satellites, about 500 kilometers higher, uh, above ground, and using those intelligent satellites to be able to actually take not only pictures, not only multi-spectral type of uh, remote sensing data that you collect now from Landsat and, uh, and uh, Sentinel and, and Prisma and other satellites, but actually to have much higher resolution, hyperspectral sensors so that you can actually uh, learn more about the land, about the soil, about uh, pests and disease, as well as the health and the estimation of um, your yield on the various crops that you are growing. The Terra Watch, as I said, is very much something that we want to do because as I, be as I began, we don't have that capability. We don't have a sovereign capability for us. The data comes always from other satellite providers. And many of them are not that friendly to us. But even if they're ones, even those that are friendly to us are now moving towards a commercial model. You know, you could get the Sentinel and you can get the Landsat uh, data pretty cheaply, almost free, as long as you massage them. However, what about the planet data or uh, uh, world view or others? Our departments are spending millions of dollars in actually uh, procuring uh, satellite data from other countries. And of course, of all of the satellites that are launched at the moment, and there's thousands of those, 90% of those satellites are commercial satellites, not government satellites like all the others were in the past. Commercial satellites will ask you to pay. And therefore, why should we in Australia always rely on other countries to give us that data and therefore not have the, the ability for us to adapt for our own local and unique requirements and to underpin our own industry, our own space industry, our own technology, rather than always buying from overseas and paying. We don't want to under, underpin someone else's industry. We want to grow our own. So the, the TerraWatch is a concept that we, we are now working very closely with GRDC, 
with MLA, with elders and others. We're having conversations about building the infrastructure for the nation. We're not asking you, the end users, to pay for it. The Australian government, certainly the previous government, invested $1.2 billion for space missions. And we will be handling a lot of the R&D aspects of that. We, the Australian farmers and agriculture and miners, deserve that infrastructure. We will build that infrastructure so that you are able to innovate on that infrastructure. And in terms of uh, the various applications that we will be applying, the technology is changing all the time. One question you might ask, I already have all the data that I get. In fact, I have too much data. And that is true because a lot of times all we do is collect data and give it to uh, the, the, the end users. End users don't want data. They want insights. They want action intelligence. And as the technology improves, you can actually get higher and higher um, resolution, higher and higher uh, ability for you to predict and to also make decisions. So water security, food security, and aspects that remote sensing has the capability to deliver now and certainly in the future will be able to be enabled with this infrastructure that we're working on. Uh, even climate change, even the effects of agriculture on our climate and the effects of climate on agriculture will be very important and more and more they'll be studied from space because the technology will get better. I know that with drones you get the best resolution but drones also have the downsides as well. With space, as the technology improves, you'll be able to do some amazing things including particularly when it is integrated with in, um, in, in situ sensors, you'll be able, for example, to um, measure carbon in soil and other kind of parameters that at the moment are not able to do uh, it from space. So the technology is changing all the time and we are committed to improving through our universities through the CSIRO and all of the other government labs to working together to build technologies that Australia can use, but also Australia can export, not only for profit, but also for helping our neighbours. And that's one thing we haven't done very well in the past, to actually help our neighbours benefit from the technologies that we have. So we invite you to participate in this journey that we have already began, we invite you to contact me and, and, have a dis and, and my colleagues to have a discussion on how might you be able to help us. And your biggest contribution would be to actually give us your problems, the requirements for us to be able to build the technology around that. The journey has already began. The government of South Australia has actually commissioned us to build a satellite that we will be launching next year. Uh, we are in the process of building that satellite at Lot 14 in, in the city. It's amazing. Most people don't know that actually now Lot 14 is building satellites. Uh, and that satellite will actually be a very advanced little satellite. As I said, a cereal box uh, satellite, but nonetheless it will have one of the most advanced hyperspectral sensors that will actually have more than 50 hyperspectral bands that will be able to do some really cool stuff, uh, including smoke detection, including water uh, moisture detection, and other kind of things that you wouldn't be able to think that you could do that with a small satellite 500 kilometers above, um, above ground. And not only that, but we are putting some AI sensors we are putting, uh, I think it's about 150 gigabytes of, of uh, storage. You can store the, the data that you collect because the bigger the resolution, the more data you will collect. But at the same time, there is a computer that will be able to process that data, to process that data 
in real time rather than sending it down for processing on the ground. That could be one of the applications, which is very, very easy to do already, is to load a machine learning model onto the satellite and to be able to do cloud detection. Now, cloud, most of the land, but perhaps not in Australia, but most of the globe, 70% of it, is actually covered with cloud. So when you're taking those images, you're wasting a lot of the images and the power and also the communications bandwidth to send useless data down rather than doing the processing on the satellite itself. Now that is already possible and we are building the models for that to occur. Uh, and as I said, we'll be launching it next year. And good on uh, the, the state government, not only the past government, but also the current government. In fact, it is the, the current government that started the journey of, of um, getting the space agency uh, and the IAC here that, that began, if you like, the rena renaissance of space in Australia. So thank you to both of those governments. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about what we are trying to do uh, at uh, Lot 14. And I would be delighted if you wanted to have a conversation about how might we work together so that we can build technologies that will be useful and used by you, uh, and of course, building our nation. Thank you. Professor Andy Coronius, thank you so much. And uh, the little boy in me is very excited. Your, your enthusiasm is infectious when on this topic. Uh, look, we have got a couple of questions. Just bear with me, I'll swap places with you. I know you're a man in demand, you've got to get somewhere, so we'll quickly get these questions. Um, first of all, just uh, I had a question here about when TerraWatch will be available. When might that be? Okay, we, are, we have just, uh, as I've showed, the three capability demonstrators, the three missions we're talking about. Uh, they are well in advance. Uh, the TerraWatch has just began now, so the conversation about how we will be able to build that might take several years. But actually, elements of the terawatts will be on the Kainini. So uh, next year, when we launch that, we're building the technologies already. N next year, when we launch that, we will be able to have elements of the terawatts. But in terms of the, the organization of uh, the mission, of the program of research, it has already began. When it will be made as, a, as an operational system, that will be a successive kind of approach, rather than just one system. It will be with one satellite starting next year, as I said, and then adding more satellites as we go on. Uh, another question. Uh, you did talk about some of the projects you're doing there for agriculture, but uh, casting our mind forward, what is an opportunity in space that you can apply to agriculture that hasn't yet been realised? I think it's probably better um, doing things better at a higher resolution and therefore being able to identify uh, plant disease, uh, optimization of inputs through being able to identify the health of the crop. Uh, one of the main, one of the main uh, pillars of the work that we will be doing with TerraWatts is to have a nationwide uh, yield estimation of grains. At the moment, that is not possible. Uh, there are lots and lots of activities and uh, screen surveys, windscreen surveys and other activities uh, at the paddock level, but wall-to-wall -wall, uh, being able to uh, estimate yield is not at the moment available. Carbon and decarbonization in general also is another area we're looking that will be further uh, enhanced. And of course, water quality. There are some elements of water quality that you are not able to do from space with the data available at the moment. Now, this uh, la last question I'll ask uh, raises as many issues as there is space junk in space. <laughs> space junk is a growing issue. What is the lifespan of the current technologies being deployed and how are they, well, recovered? Uh, it's, a tr it's a complicated topic. Uh, it is a complicated topic and there's a lot of technologies on recovering junk. It is a big issue, actually, uh, not only for, for um, the astronomers that are up in arms, but also our First Nations people, 
Uh, there are a lot of issues with space junk, and particularly if they're not controlled and something happens and there is a collision, then that causes more fragments, which can become a very kind of a ripple effect that can be catastrophic. But there are regulations. You can't just, um, you just can't load, launch a satellite without getting the right permissions from the Australian government, and that's administered by the space agency here. Um, and one of the requirements for you would be a, a process of deorbiting the satellite at the end of its life. Uh, usually, like the Canini, for instance, uh, is likely to run anywhere between three to five or six years, but we have to have mechanisms for that to burn up gracefully when it comes in the atmosphere. You can't just simply have them there creating problems. Professor Andy Coronius, thank you so much for your answers as well. Here's a gift in uh, gratitude for you joining us today. If anyone wants to get in touch, there were some questions we weren't able to ask because of time. SmartSat CRC yeah, website. Google, us. Google, Google us. you and then away we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Fascinating topic, topic um, as I say, I'm a little boy just excited about those things, talking about missions and Lego and space capable nation, it's all good stuff. Hey, we're moving along to our next speaker and sustainability, carbon and natural capital certainly are buzzwords of the 2020s, we've heard them actually mentioned here already today, but no one knows them better, particularly where producers can start with them, than Dr Madeline Mitchell. Dr Mitchell is the science lead of carbon and natural capital with the Food Agility CRC. She is a plant scientist by training with broad interests in social, economic and environmental sustainability for agriculture. At the Food Agility CRC, she leads a research team focused on measuring, managing and valuing natural capital in agriculture for productive, profitable and climate resilient farming systems. There is more about her in the program that you have to hand in your bag. Uh, she'll be speaking with us today on sustainability, carbon and natural capital. Where do grain and livestock producers start? Please welcome Dr Madeline Mitchell. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so for those of you not familiar with us, uh, Food Agility is a cooperative research centre, so like SmartSat, our focus is on data and digital-driven solutions for a sustainable agri-food sector. Uh, so our projects are designed to bridge that gap between industry and research, as with other CRCs. We have three pillars of work, and I lead the work on the carbon and natural capital. So as one of the earlier talks today, I will um, begin by setting a bit of context for where I'm working and where Food Agility is working in. Um, and then I'll talk about three specific projects that the CRC is involved in. So again, let's begin with some definitions just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so the common understanding of sustainability that has been coming across already this morning is that sustainability is about meeting the needs of our generation, the current generations, without compromising the needs of future generations to meet their needs, and that's social, financial, and environmental. Um, then when we talk about carbon, we're talking both about carbon that's sequestered in the landscape, so in the soils and vegetation, um, but we're also talking about carbon and other greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases um, emitted through farming practices uh, and their inputs. So this includes things like fertilizer and the enteric emissions of methane from livestock. Um, and then finally, when we're talking about natural capital, we're talking about the renewable and non-renewable resources. So this includes plants and animals, soil and water and carbon um, that provide us with various benefits. So this might be anything from the sort of really big and important, um, the climate regulation, uh, crop pollination, but then also through to the more personal like recreation. Um, so I've said here that sustainability, carbon and natural capital are everyone's concerns because there are a lot of people, a lot of players in this space who are interested. And in particular, you know, this is because farmers in Australia are stewards of over half of Australia's landmass. And so there's huge potential for public good as well as private benefit. 
Um, I won't go into this, this isn't meant to be comprehensive, but you know, at the centre of it we have farmers, you know, we've talked about sustainability being about intergenerational equity, about stewardship, um, sort of feeding into the farming businesses. We've got advisors who are interested in, I suppose, you know, supporting best practice and things like that. Um, we have banks, industry bodies, supply chains and governments, all who have various sustainability and net zero or low carbon emissions reduction commitments. In particular for the banks, they're really starting to think about risk. So there's the task force on climate related financial disclosure and the task force on nature related financial disclosure. So for banks and insurers, particularly those who are really involved with ag lending, this is becoming increasingly important. They want to support um, the sustainability and the resilience of the agribusiness customers. Um, yeah, and then again, you know, we've got, we've got um, supply chains and I'll talk a little bit more about them. So. Um, they also have these commitments around, around that, and we've already talked about the consumers and that responding to changing community and consumer sentiment. Um, and just to flag as well, the ACCC has announced that they have a focus on uh, environmental and sustainability claims for 2022-23, so this is important. Um, and in this context, the question really becomes, how do we support both on-farm practice change um, and provide credible evidence of those outcomes. And this is kind of the area where food agility is operating. Okay, so again, this isn't a comprehensive slide. This is a, giving you a bit of an example of where we fit in. Um, so really, overall, we have this, you know, most of these players have this overarching goal of wanting to see both the um, prosperity and the resilience of Australian agriculture, and that's through sustainability, through managing natural, natural capital and carbon on farm. Um, that is related to these broader industry goals, so whether they be about being net zero, nature positive, and that element of maintaining social licence. So that goal is, is very long term. I don't think that's going to change significantly. We might refine it, but you know that's something that we can all get on board with. Um, those outcomes, those net zero, goals and things like that, they're also quite long term. Um, and then underneath that, there are sort of specific opportunities and tools that are feeding into that at the moment, and that's the stuff that's more likely to change in the shorter and medium term. But that's also where food agility is operating right now. Um, so again, um, we've got some examples around the Emissions Reduction Fund for carbon farming. Um, there is you know, a national pilots around carbon and sustainability. There was a biodiversity market that was announced just last week. Um, but then there's other kinds of opportunities around things like green loans or the non-ARF carbon markets. Um, but below that and still within the opportunities section are kind of the less formal opportunities. So there's talk now about the difference between offsetting and inset uh, insetting. So rather than um, getting carbon credits and then selling them outside the supply chain, outside the value chain, there's a sense that perhaps if um, what you want to achieve or what the industry wants to achieve is to be able to make those low carbon or net zero claims, then you keep those credits within the value chain to be able to claim that. Um, and then more, more broadly and generally, you know, there are, as I said, you know, this idea of managing risk and improving the land asset, you know, managing that important asset as well. So they're the more informal opportunities. Within that, um, this is again where the food agility starts bringing in those tools and technologies. So we have um, dashboards and decision making support, uh, remotely sensed and spatial information, so stuff that links to that SmartSat presentation you just heard, um, measurement, reporting and verification platforms, so that ability to share the data, um, and then very specific things around greenhouse gas calculators. But you know, I'll get a bit more practical. I'll talk about some practical examples now. Um, yeah, but I suppose the, the context of this too is you know, very, very simply, um, if you were looking at participating in some kind of scheme or opportunity at the moment, uh, you would probably want to first you know, plan, work out what opportunity is relevant, how it fits in with your other business goals, um, then baseline, work out where you're at, say whether that's doing a carbon baseline or natural capital accounts. Um, then implement some kind of change to, to improve the natural capital, improve the carbon sequestration, uh, and then finally, you would measure, verify, and report to then access those rewards and benefits. Um, there are barriers at each of those levels, and that's where our projects kind of come in. Um, so I'll link back to them as we go through. So that first one, simply plan and set goals. Um, that can be quite a challenge. You know, as you, you've seen, it's a complex space. It's an evolving space. Uh, and so this is one example of a project looking to 
support that identification of opportunities and, and I suppose taking up those opportunities. So this is a project that we recently delivered with NAB and it was very much identified by them. So they were seeing their pharma customers coming to them effectively with analysis paralysis, going, okay, there are these opportunities and risks associated with climate change and sustainability. What do we do about it? Where do we start? And so um, this was a project that we, um, that I led, which was around doing a kind of systematic assessment of some of those risks and opportunities and linking in with the sustainability frameworks of the subsectors that you'll hear about this afternoon. Um, so having a systematic assessment of the risks and opportunities, looking at what adaptation options might be to address those risks and opportunities, uh, and then understanding some of the influences on the private costs and private benefits, but also those public impacts. Because again, when we're talking carbon and natural capital, you know, this has, um, they have broader reaching effects. Uh, yeah, and so that is, is now a um, decision support tool that NAB is hoping to roll out to support those banker and customer conversations. Um, so that's a pretty exciting uh, example of real world impact for us. Um, so the second project, again, like, there's a bit of, there's obviously overlap, but this one fits a bit into the um, estimating a baseline and then implementing practice change. So this is the Range Language, Range Lynch, oh, that's really hard, Range Lens Carbon Project. Um, and it's, it's pretty new uh, and it's, it's focused in Northern Australia, but I know that, you know, Range Lens are actually um, an important part of systems, you know, all, all across, well, across most of Australia. So this is a project in collaboration with AACO, so Australia's biggest beef producer. They are a very large corporate entity, um, but they still share common drivers with family farms. So they have their own sustainability framework. They're also interested in meeting the needs of, um, changing needs of community in the marketplace. Um, and they're interested in what they can do to regenerate the landscape, be nature positive, and support the next generation as well. They are interested in climate action. Um, for them, it's about you know, understanding their own um, their own impact and then addressing that. And so they're interested in both the additional revenue streams potentially from the carbon credits, but also in managing risk. For them, as with many producers, um, there is a lack of knowledge and data around this. So, you know, what carbon is in their landscape um, and also that cost of baselining. So that can be quite expensive for soil carbon and it's in the, it's in the tens, of million, yeah, tens of millions of dollars for AACO. Um, so, we have a, a multi-partner project, and I'll just go through briefly uh, what some of them do, because that gives you a bit of a sense of how the project fits together. So um, we have Flint Pro, which was just mentioned by Minister Scriven. So they are the ones who are um, pulling all of the data together so that AACO can understand where they currently sit in terms of the carbon that's in their landscape, in the soils and vegetation, and where they could be. Uh, we've got CarbonLink, who are doing on-the-ground soil sampling and then helping to implement the practice change. SIBO labs who are using remotely sensed and other data to model pasture biomass and understand um, the, the types of the carbon that's in the woody vegetation. And then within that we have Fed Uni, ETS and CSU contributing research to fill in some of those gaps. Uh, and so what we hope with this project is that it will obviously um, AACO is the first beneficiary, but we hope that this kind of work will be applicable more broadly across the rangelands. Now, the third project is the Cool Soil Initiative. So this is a, a paddock to product partnership across the supply chain. And um, it, it came about because Mars Pet Care, Kellogg's, other big buyers of grain, we now have Allied Pinnacle and Manildra, they all have sustainability frameworks, sustainability commitments, and emissions reduction commitments. But what they've realized is a lot of their emissions are actually really outside their control. They're what's called scope three, so they happen pre-farm gate or in transport and processing. And so this is, that's why we have this whole supply chain collaboration here. So uh, this works mostly in um, New South Wales and a bit into Northern Victoria at the moment, but there's discussions to, to potentially bring it to South Australia. Um, so this project is a, a three year project, but will have a life beyond the CRC. Um, and the idea is to support on ground practice change, um, understanding soil health and emissions so that 
the farmers have the insights they need to adjust their farming practices and address these, these new concerns, and the corporates are actually able to report on their emissions reduction. They can say, not only do we have these goals, but we are directly contributing to, um, to this in these regions where we source our grain. Um, yeah, so that one is a oh, time check. Um, and then, so then as part of that, we have some research around, um, yeah, the, the types of practices involved. Um, so there's been a lot of work around, actually, we talked about acidity, so, so some work on um, acidity and liming, um, some stubble management and things like that. Um, and then part of it too is around finding those um, benefits for the farmers who are involved. So we have a spatial data portal to then support that, I suppose, yeah, that insight for the farm practice change um, and the management. So, um, really, <laughs> to watch this space, I know the, the title sounded maybe a bit more definitive, but it's a really complex and evolving space. Um, I've listed just a couple of free resources that might be helpful. Um, there are some national programs to look at those links between natural capital accounts on farm and what's actually happening for profitability and the resilience of the farm. Um, now, the, the tools and opportunities will change, but I think that the, that underlying principle of being able to define your sustainability goals um, and demonstrate those credentials, demonstrate the practice change and the outcomes that are contributing to those goals, um, whether that be you know, connecting through to supply chains, to consumers, to financial institutions, um, like that is, that is a trend that is here to stay, um, and those claims will need to be backed by credible data. and so. Um, we're hoping in the future to see this more integration of the tools as well, so that you'll be able to collect the data once and then share it as appropriate to access some of these benefits. I think that's, uh, that's me done. I'm very happy to take questions now. Thank you. And Mitchell, thank you so much. I'm just going to come behind you here and drop my gear off here. I have got something very important to share with someone in the audience. Just let me get this up on my screen. Someone's left their lights on in the car park. So just have a quick refreshment while I find this message. Um, plate number S729CBT White Mazda. You've left your lights on. So um, there is a break coming up shortly if you don't want to identify yourself. And you can sneak out quietly at that point in time. Uh, Okay. Now, a question for you, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, if agriculture sells its carbon credits to other industries, are we at risk of not being able to cover our own industry emissions? That, yeah, that's a really good question. And yeah, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, while there's been huge interest in carbon credits, understandably, um, there's, it's definitely worth considering yeah, that, that potential trade-off because we do have we have individual businesses and we have all of the industry bodies um, who are looking to make those low carbon and net zero claims. So yeah, if you sell those credits, you can't count them towards your own claims. So it's a very important consideration. Uh, do growers need to be prepared for sustainability as banks start to mandate credentials to get a loan? I think, again, um, yes. I can't comment on you know, when and how banks might be mandating it, but banks are really interested in this and they're really considering in this and at the moment um, it's not a mandate but uh, NAB and Commonwealth Bank both are trialling green loans for agriculture and so again if not a mandate the ability to demonstrate uh, what you're doing and the sustainability of that or the improvements you're making will be really important to access finance or access better terms for finance. Uh, do you think South Australia's grain industry has an opportunity to be the most sustainable in the nation with a lot of natural advantages? So for instance, we've got close proximity to ports, we've got good soil, nitrogen, etc. Uh, yeah, I think potentially. You are speaking to a Victorian, so um, you're asking me to betray my state here. Um, but um, certainly the, the comment earlier about the, the rainfall and that, um, you know, the really high efficiency of use of nat natural resources um, could be a story to tell. Uh, what are some of the barriers for our farmers to, be, to undertake carbon farming? There's a lot of talk about it, but how real is the opportunity, the question asked? Um, it is real and it is relatively complex in some ways. Um, and so that's where um, some of those projects are coming in in the sense of first uh, identifying the opportunity can have challenges. Definitely the baselining, the measuring, the monitoring can be complex. Um, 
and then those trade-offs between the, um, say, the carbon credits for selling externally versus the carbon credits for holding. Um, that's where there are a number of pilots that might be worth looking into um, that are either more targeted, so that carbon and biodiversity pilot is around specifically planting biodiverse species, getting the carbon payment and then the, um, uh, the biodiversity payment, although I think the, the, round, the latest round's just closed, but that kind of thing is an opportunity to sort of um, test things out. Um, and then there are a number of carbon project developers, so the support, um, and for that there's a carbon practice, a carbon code, a code of conduct as well. So, you know, there are a lot of reputable companies who are in it for the long term. The carbon projects through the Emissions Reduction Fund are 25 year plus, so it's a really important relationship for both parties to find that, yeah, that, that right um, project support. Uh, though this next question comes, I think it was on Friday, the federal government announced a new biodiversity credit scheme, so this, the, the landscape has expanded. The question asks, measurement and auditing costs are constraints. Who should be bringing it all together across the different opportunities for farmers? The question asks, when the CRC winds up? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, okay, so this is where partnerships are really, really important, and all of our projects are designed to have a life post-CRC. So the Cool Soil Initiative is currently looking at a, um, an independent entity to keep going after uh, the CRC winds up. So what we do is we co-invest in that research to kick it off and to give it that um, credibility. Um, but then that will, it will be its own kind of um, entity. Um, same with the Rangelands Carbon Project. So um, Food Agility doesn't hold any of the IP. That's all going to groups like Flint Pro, Carbon Link and um, Sorry, I'm blanking now, SIBO. Um, and so there are opportunities for this, these tools um, to have a life post-CRC through these commercial entities. Uh, and what I do hope to see, and what's really nice with the AI Co project as well, is that we see really good collaboration between those three commercial partners. And so it's that integration of um, tools and data sets as well that I think will be really beneficial. Good questions here and good answers too, so I'm just going to ask one more. Do you think one day it will become mandatory for farmers to demonstrate emission or natural capital credentials to access domestic or international markets? I think it's a possibility. Um, there's already, particularly in Europe, there's already strong um, trends towards that um, with canola and ISCC. So, um, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's a distinct possibility. And so, for example, our growers in the Cool Soil Initiative, for them it is about you know, being on the front foot as well, getting an understanding of what's going on before anything becomes mandated or, or, or otherwise, I suppose. All right, uh, Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a small gift uh, in appreciation of your time with us. Thanks for your presentation. It's been really good hot on the heels of Science Week, which was only a week or so ago, I think. Uh, we talked about it a lot on air to have a very science-based focus at the start of the program with Professor Andy Coronios from one CRC and then Dr Mitchell there from the Food Agility CRC as well. We are heading towards our break. Uh, we do need you to be back at 10.30. Uh, thanks, and I'll go through some housekeeping here. Uh, do not fear, the coffee cart did vanish, but it hasn't gone. It's gone downstairs, okay? Uh, so we've set the scene for policy and research points of view. Uh, coming up after our morning tea, we'll hear from speakers about the national landscape, including Tony Ma from the National Farmers Federation and Katie McRobert from the Australian Farm Institute. The coffee cart sponsored by Mella Olsen Lawyers, has moved to the lower level for your morning tea. As you'll see, Growing SA has a full exhibition down there. Make sure you visit the exhibitors regarding products and services showcased. And is Minister Scriven putting the virtual reality goggles on and delivering a calf or something? I can't remember exactly what was happening, but I think there's some virtual reality stuff happening down there, so tune in for that. Uh, our event today has been organised by Ag Communicators. Uh, the team has two large bells. They will ring when it's time to come back up here for our next session. When you hear them, you'll have five minutes before the next session begins, and we will be starting at 10.30 sharp, so you'll need to hot-foot it back upstairs. So we'll see you then at 10.30. Thank you. Thank you.